grace to you and peace. And don't we need peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our opening prayer this morning is from Johnny Miller in Colorado. Johnny. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you guys. Let's just go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we all woke up this morning and came to hang out together. Lord, just be with us through this service and throughout the day. And be with Barbara while he speaks. We love you, Jesus. Amen. And thank you, Johnny. Now we're going to have Naomi in the Democratic Republic of Congo sing us a song this morning. And there might be a little background noise, but I know the Lord will help us to worship through it. Uh, thank you, Dawn. Uh, Maria is going to sing a song right now in Swahili. And uh, her song is titled today, Jesus Cross is Powerful. It gives life and joy. Ah, Naomi, go ahead. Ah, she think I know is a key. Put a foot on my pinsy, a key, when you win. You say, Lena, to open the sun, no walk away from the job, Mota. Nikama, my foot, I don't look, I open your phone, the bazaar, she think I know is a key. Ushinda <laughs> Now, Christo can you say you may put your mother away so you go and go to one walk at what you know, your mother is a one walk at what you know, your mother is a one me and a car, the world of your coercion talky. We put on, we put on, we put on a coat of foot of you. Shiki, Nagisu, I give you Kani Sani. How are the Shiki? Nagisu, I give you Kani Sani. Musalaba, Yesu, Ulebuja, Ukabila, Nachuki. Pana Gali Gata, when I asked you, Ali Jinga Mazabao. Mazabao, Yaleo, Sikama Mazabao, Yagana, Kale. Chuki Kamila, Matangana Zia Imetawala. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. That was beautiful. Thank you. We're grateful. Wow. Okay. We're going to go right into a couple of bright spots right now. And if you can see, uh, do you all see a picture up on the screen? Yes, Joe. Well, that went first. Well, so I'm going to share just real briefly. So Joan and I work at the thrift store at the Naval Academy, and all the money that we get in goes back into military families. And on Thursday, I was working when Joan was in um, Chicago taking care of her granddaughter who broke her foot. It was kind of the beginning of this whole invasion thing that was going on in the Ukraine. And we have very strong, strict regulations as far as giving uniforms, military uniforms away. You can only sell them to active duty personnel. So on Thursday, I had six women come into the store before the store even opened. And we ended up being able to give them probably 100 uniforms 
uh, boots and hats and beanies. And, and it was just, just a beautiful experience for me personally, because I'm so far removed from what's going on in Russia and Ukraine that I felt so far removed. But seeing these women who are young pilots who were leaving the next day on a cargo flight come in and out of their own pockets want to do something. And one of them said, well, we were just at Walmart the other day and we bought over a thousand dollars with the diapers and bottles and things to feed babies. And then Joan has something to share about what happened yesterday in regards to this picture. Well, continuing what happened on Thursday when I was away, and by the way, thank you, Dawn. And Dawn, Pat, um, uh, Adrian, um, some of the House uh, members volunteer at the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society. But anyway, on Saturday, uh, usually it's staff all military, but they knew they would need additional assistance. So um, it, uh, you know, I was privileged to be here and able to go. And so did Don and Bart. He is now officially a member of the volunteer group at Navy Marine Corps Relief. But uh, this is a picture of yet more uniform somewhere between uh, BDUs, so battle dress uniforms that are no longer uh, regulation for the US um, to use. And so they had been gathered up and uh, you see them uh, being folded and taken away. Barn, uh, Bart and Don helped load them into the uh, van and then they flew out yesterday afternoon to the Ukraine. Um, in particular, um, uh, boots and as Don said, warm clothing and uh, not just warm clothing for the military, but also for uh, some of the refugees and others. Uh, this is being started up at, because of a public affairs officer at the Naval Academy having family in the Ukraine. So that started the coordination. And we're just uh, very blessed to be able to help in some small way uh, these courageous people. Wonderful. That's a bright spot, a huge bright spot. And now here is another bright spot. We had a party and look who all came together. <laughs> so originally this was going to be a, a little surprise party for Joan, who some knew, she knew were coming to our house for her party. But what nobody knew was that the Frasers were actually going to be in town also. So I had everybody come at 1130, except for the Frasers, and they came at noon. And so nobody knew what was going on. No. So we ended up having a really wonderful time together. And everybody, it was so great meeting Jeremiah and everybody meeting everyone together. So it was, it was a really wonderful, bright spot for us. And I missed it, but <laughs> uh, Dawn sent me a video clip. Everybody was singing to happy birthday to me but anyway but it was so much fun to see everybody in the video clip thank yeah. you for that that was a bright spot for me and happy birthday yes, happy to you birthday. on that well our word for this week is first something to think about in baseball and the kingdom of god you must get to first base before moving on and that uh, verse it should say seek but see first sounds good too. See first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So Johnny, would you get us started with the prayer time, please? Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Oh Lord, thank you so much for this day. Today, we just come to you, Jesus. Uh, we praise you for Mervis and Malawi who have fully recovered from pneumonia and severe abdominal pain. Thank you, Jesus, for healing her body. We praise you for Heidi, Miranda's friend, Julie, who had a large mass removed from her abdomen and learned it was benign. 
Thank you, God. Praise you for Jason Miranda's friend, Charlie, who's recently become a Christian and is seeking Christ in his daily life. Praise you. For a surprise house party in John, Bart and John's home that included the Frazier family and friends from the Methodist world. Thank you for bringing people together. Thank you so much. Lord, today we just uh, lift up Russia. Um, we pray for Russia to stop the invasion and for peace to prevail in Ukraine without further injury or loss of life for all involved. Pray for your protection and provision for Ukrainians still in country and the refugees that are distant from countries worldwide. Thank you, Johnny, for offering those praises and prayers. And you'll notice there's just two prayers listed there because I want us to take some time right now and pray some more. So I'm opening up the floor uh, and you can open up your mic just to take some time to pray specifically for the situation in Ukraine and Russia and uh, the need for peace. So let's just join in and pray as the Lord leads. Lord, I must confess, sometimes I don't know how to pray when there's situations like this that just seem so overwhelming. And, uh, but the good news is, Lord, is you are in our lives and you are there. I do pray, Lord, that you are hearing the prayers of the millions and millions of people that are praying around the world, that you would intervene and um, thwart the plans of evil. I do pray, Lord, that evil would be revealed, that those things that are to be hidden would be seen, that the plans that are being perpetrated and pushed would be thwarted. And Lord, we thank you so much for these people in Ukraine who are so brave and who are so inspiring to us. Lord, I just thank you that you have already made miraculous things happen. I thank you for the prayers we've received from so many over there, in particular, the soldiers who are writing and saying that they cannot explain it, but bullets are going by them that aren't hitting them, that they feel a presence when they're hiding that they know is you. So Lord, I just thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for this day. Just pray that you would open hearts, open eyes and minds, that we could see what's going on and what's needed and how we can best offer our lives for you in these situations. Lord, give the people of Ukraine and those in Russia courage. Give them open-mindedness. Help them in all their needs, Lord. Guide and direct each one, I pray. Uh, Lord, uh, I pray that the people in Ukraine uh, in this terrible, terrible time uh, can feel your love. Um, and I hope that this love Never ending love gives them strength and courage to endure the terrible things that are going on. I, I pray that uh, from Psalm 46, uh, God is our refuge and strength and everlasting help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the or earth give away and the mountains fall into the sea. Amen. Father God, I lift up the children in Ukraine. Lord, I cannot imagine my children having that fear or seeing uh, the things that they may be seeing over there. Protect them. Give them some joy, Lord. Um, I pray for their mothers and 
and fathers that they could provide some sort of sense of strength and well-being and that they would just find joy lord um let them be children and keep them protected from this nightmare in jesus name lord Father, in so many cases, uh, those that are suffering are, are, are nameless to us. We don't know them personally, but in some cases, uh, they are known. Or Don Killenbeck, who's joining us uh, right now, he has a co-worker named Anna, uh, who's up there in Poland. As often as she can get there to help, she's got family that are in Ukraine, that are refugees now, uh, and others. So his heart goes out to Anna and ours does as well. And, and so many others, my friend Gary, Gary Munson, uh, has a friend Alexander who is a Russian and he supports Putin and they are an exchange back and forth together and have such huge differences, but still are able to maintain a friendship. So we thank you that peace can be worked out in the midst of these great differences and this great division. Bring unity and uh, may your spirit work in a mighty way to bring peace to this region, to Ukraine, to Russia, to our world, through the one who is able to bring that peace, the Prince of Peace, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Well, let's continue with the Lord's Prayer, saying that together, our Father, Father. who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And Joan, you can go ahead and read the first scripture, and Heidi, you will follow. Thank you. <clears throat> Have mercy, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you and only you, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region, and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thank you. Thank you for those readings, and thank you for tuning in. And let us be mindful always that in the midst of dark times, uh, the sun is still shining, it's shining above the clouds, and it's shining enough to produce beautiful flowers like these. They're all around us. And they remind us of God's goodness, his grace. It's kind of like the rainbow, you know, after the flood. In the midst of all the trials and challenges and the difficulties of life in our world, um, this is, I'm going to leave them there. This is uh, the good news, the good news of uh, smiles that are there. And uh, let's greet people wherever we go with that smile and the love of the Lord. And with a smile for you this morning before my message is Craig Kennedy down in Florida. Craig has a little Brother Craig story for you. Craig? <laughs> Play ball. So 
I went to uh, my grandson's baseball game yesterday over at the park, and there's about 12 games going on at one time. And you, you're talking about a, a time of, of excitement and, and some division. <laughs> I felt so bad for them umpires, man. I mean, when you get there, the Cubs sat on one side, got my Cubs hat on and my Cubs shirt on, and the Yankees was on the other. And the parents, man, they weren't exactly real cordial with one another. These are 10-year-old kids. You think that it would just be a big time of, of community. Well, that poor umpire couldn't do nothing right. Well, this story is about this, uh, about this team that made it to the final game that would get them to Williamsburg, that would get them to the all-star games. And uh, it was a close game. It was the bottom of the nine. The team at bat was down by just one run. Bases were loaded. And there was two outs. And there was a young boy sitting at the end of the bench that wasn't very good. <laughs> In fact, he was a little physically impaired. And his parents put him on the team just so that he would have some community and that he would get to meet some of the other boys, but never thought in a million years that he was going to be put in this situation. And when the coach said, Johnny, grab a bat. Oh, no. The whole team said, Coach, what are you doing? And Johnny hadn't hit the ball all year. This is it. We, 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 we can't put Johnny up there. He said, Johnny, grab a bat, son. And the coach ran out there and put his arm around Johnny and said, boy, just do the best that you can. Well, of course, the first ball was a fastball, and the umpire said strike one, and the kids in the dugout – hands were in their feet and the parents they were worse than the kid they were screaming all kinds of things at that poor coat next pitch was a strike two they were just silence third pitch little johnny somehow hit the ball back to the pitcher and he began to run as hard as he could and that old pitcher looked at the ball and he looked at johnny and he threw that ball over the first baseman's head clear into right field well though johnny made the turn going to second and that right fielder took the ball and slung it over the third baseman's head. <laughs> Little Johnny's doing the best that he can to get around them bags. And he hit third, and the boy in left field tossed it over the catcher's head, and Johnny scored. And he won the game. <laughs> and the kids on the field just showed so much mercy and so much grace that they were willing to give up that trip to Willingsburg mm -hmm. to show some love to John and the entire stadium was quiet and was in awe of the demonstration of love thanks for listening oh, great story and thank you for sharing Craig and uh, I want us to, to think about that game baseball that's one of Craig's favorite sports he's got his hat uh, back in uh, 50 years ago it was there was a commercial that came out and it was pretty popular in the 70s and it said four things, uh, baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. It wasn't Ford for some reason, <laughs> it, wasn't Ford. it was great, it could have been a Ford, but it was uh, Chevrolet. Now, what, what do all those have in common? Well, they are all American. Baseball is an all American sport. When you go to a baseball game, you wanna get a hot dog, and uh, apple pie, and nobody makes a better apple pie than my wife, and then Chevrolet, they're all American. But let's take a look at that baseball. Uh, in fact, my brother right now, Steve, is down in Arizona because that is where the Kansas City Royals, and he broadcasts for the Royals, that is where they do training. And he's down there enjoying his time with his wife, watching them play, and looks like they're not gonna be playing uh, you know, play ball for real for at least a week because of some strike along the way. But uh, everybody that is into baseball wants to see them play ball. Well, maybe you have baseball experience of your own. I do. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, I, uh, I think I was in elementary school, I must have been in the sixth grade or something. I was on a team that was sponsored by uh, forest Lumberteria, okay? So they made wood uh, supplies and such. They had uh, lumber there. And I was out 
with the team and I was up to bat. Now, I want you to know that I wasn't a very good player. And I'm just not saying that because I want to be self-deprecating. I just wasn't a very good player. In fact, I hadn't even had a run. And so when I got up to bat and swung and actually hit the ball, I was about as surprised as anybody was. Uh, not only that, but the back broke when I hit it. So when all of that is happening, I'm hitting the ball for the first time, breaking the bat. Sometimes you just get lost and you just stand there and you're just amazed. And people are saying, run, run. Well, where do you run? Well, hopefully you run to first base. And I did. I actually gone on base. I, I, I think I might have even made it to second. But it is one of those experiences that I just remember. You got to go to first base first. Now, I was sharing uh, a story like this with Flavian. Actually, when we were talking this week, we meet once a week. He's in DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, and here I am in America. And we were having our discipleship time. And because they have started a house church in their home in DRC, he's also, in fact, this morning for them, he already gave a message that is on the same subject. So I wanted to talk to him about baseball. I said, uh, you know about baseball, uh, Flavian? And he said, nope, never heard of baseball. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'm kind of stuck here. Um, maybe that's not a good illustration to use over there in DRC, Flavian, but let me explain to you a little bit about it. By the way, Flavian, uh, do you guys play cricket? He says, no, we don't play cricket. And then I'm searching for what. So I pulled up on the share screen, a baseball diamond. And I said, here's the way it works. There's home plate, there's first base. And when you hit the ball, like I was talking about when I was a kid on Forest Lumberteria team, you go to first base. And then if you can, you go to second base if somebody else hits the ball and all the way around third. And then when you get home, you get a point. And he was getting it, but I don't think he shared it this uh, Sunday because they don't play baseball there, but they do here. The point is, we got to get to first base first. Now, we are in the Lent season, which started last Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, and goes all the way up until Easter. It culminates with Easter, the resurrection. But before the resurrection, there's the crucifixion. And the reason for the crucifixion is our sin. And so we start the Lenten season on Ash Wednesday with a time of penance, a time of sorrow, a time of reflection on our own lives and our condition of sin. And so we would think that the first thing that we would do then is repent, right? Wouldn't that be first base in this picture to repent first? Well, let, let's see. I mean, certainly in the life of the Jesus and the uh, John the Baptist, for that matter, the first words out of John the Baptist's mouth as he begins his public ministry as recorded in the scriptures, we find this in Matthew and Luke, we find John saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven as at hand. Jesus is saying the same thing. With John, it says of John, it says he came after being in the wilderness for all of his life, all of his growing up. He's there waiting, waiting for the Lord to call him into that public ministry. And when he does, he comes preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it's written in the prophet Isaiah, a voice crying in the wilderness Behold, one crying in the wilderness says, make way the way of the Lord. Make it straight. Make those ravines rise up and those hills come down. Make the crooked road straight and the rough road smooth. It's like making a highway for the one who is coming. And so that's how John presented. And when people came to him, his words are just astounding. He said, who warned you to flee the wrath of God to come? Actually, he front loads it this way. You brood of vipers. Anybody ever call you that? Brood of vipers. You sons of snakes. Those are strong words. He's calling them into account. Those that are coming for baptism. You 
brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath of God to come? Bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance first. You who say that you are sons of Abraham, the Lord can raise up from these stones sons of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. So what would you do hearing something like that, being called out like that? Here these people are coming to what appears to be first base, repent, but he challenges them. Why are you really coming? Why are you coming to me? Because the people called out, they said, what shall we do? And he responded to them. He said, hey, if you have two coats and you see somebody without a coat, give him one. And then the tax collectors came to him and said, well, what shall we do? He said, well, don't take any more money than is required of you. And even the Roman soldiers, some of them came to him and said, well, what, what shall we do? And he said, well, don't take money from people by force and, and don't accuse them of things they haven't done and be content with your wages. See, the point in all of this is that there is something that John, and I believe God through John, is expecting before we get to what we think maybe is first base, if it is, to repent. Jesus, when he steps on the public scene, after being baptized by John, and then going into the wilderness for 40 days, 40 days of preparation, where he is in there in prayer and fasting. And at this point, I want to make a public service announcement with regard to fasting and prayer which is a part of the Lenten experience. As we just a little bit ago prayed for Ukraine, I want to invite you to join me this week on Wednesday to fast and to pray. It's the Lent season. We have a situation going on that is, uh, is captivating the world. Uh, let our prayers be seasoned with a time of reflection, a time of fasting. And so from Tuesday night after dinner until 24 hours later to the following Wednesday evening, I'm not planning on eating anything. And during those times, my intent will be to pray, to pray for the situation in Ukraine, in Russia, in our world, in our own lives, in our church, to pray for the things that God will lay on my heart. I invite you to join me. That's what Jesus was doing there in the wilderness. And when he stepped off of that situation, that time in which he was provided for in the wilderness, by the way, that's very interesting in itself. He was fasting and going without, and yet God was providing for him in that time of need. He does when we get really serious with him, when we don't play games with this thing called repentance and a turning. There's all kinds of show that we can do and people do to give that impression. Jesus called out the religious leaders saying you go about with the appearance of mourning and fasting, but in your hearts, it's not there. So this is a heart matter, is it not? And so Jesus comes from that point on saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this past week, we've spent some time, those uh, in the hour preceding, and all are welcome to that. It's our little life together group, uh, reading and going deeper into one of those readings for today, which was from Psalm 51. But we were pray reading through the course of that whole psalm this week, and then we talked about it during our time in life together. Well, that's about David. And David is there pouring out his heart to the Lord. And it's an amazing psalm. You need to read it and think about it and think about yourself as you do so and your relationship to God and where you're at and where you need to be. But what did it take for David to write that psalm? Well, we have to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And David is right on the cusp of greatness, 
Finally, after all these years, he's there in Jerusalem. He wants to build the temple. Uh, the engagements in, in warfare and conflict have been incredibly successful. And there in chapter 11, he's got it's springtime and uh, folks are going out uh, into battle uh, as they did in springtime. And he has his uh, chief commander, Joab, going out and uh, he doesn't go. He decides to stay back, maybe give himself a break. I mean, doesn't he deserve a break? He's been working hard. It's been many years. Saul was in power for a while, chasing David around. Doesn't he need a break? Sure. So while he's taking a break, he's up there on his rooftop looking around, and he happens to notice a very beautiful woman taking a bath out there on the rooftop herself. He notices her. What's going through his head right then? What goes through your head or mine when we're tempted by something that is very attractive and compelling? Well, he yields to it, he wants to find out who she is, he gets her name, and he has her come over. He can do that. He's the king. Isn't he entitled to that? So he does so and sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. She lets him know. Now what is he going to do? Oh. Well, this is where one sin leads to another, doesn't it? And it does so in the life of David. He calls in her husband, Uriah, who is a good man. I mean, he is one of his best. And he comes in and he wants him to go home, be with his wife, so he can blame the pregnancy on Uriah, her husband. But he won't do that. He says to David, how can I do that? My men are in the field. And so he doesn't go home. He sleeps out there, outside, right outside his door. The next night, he tries again, David does with him, and he gets him drunk and gets him, you know, a little loopy and just so that now he'll go home. Well, he does get drunk and he does get a little loopy, but not enough so to that he's going to go home. No, he sleeps out again. So now what is David going to do? Well, he gets with uh, Joab and he tells him, I want you to put Uriah on the front line. And in doing so, it ends up costing Uriah's life, which was David's plan. So all of this is going on in time, and, and David is not convicted yet about this. How much time is going by? Well, it says by the end of chapter 11 that he has a child, son. At least nine months, right? What's going on during those nine months? What is David doing? Well, David may still be at home, uh, you know, uh, relaxing. Is he not doing things on the Sabbath that they would do? He's a very religious man. Are, we, are you not religious? Here you are at house church on Sunday. Of course, you're religious. We do these things. These are our duties. No doubt he was doing that, but he still wasn't convicted. Whew. What's going on with him? What's going on with us? Is first base repentance? Or is there something that needs to precede that? Well, with David, he hasn't repented yet. Will he? Well, we know that he does in Psalm 51, but what's going on here? Finally, it takes the prophet Nathan to come to David. Sometimes it takes people like that in our lives that get our attention, that need to get our attention. Sometimes God wants to use us to get the attention of others that need to be informed about certain things. And in David's case, it was about what he had done with Bathsheba. And so he tells him a story. And David was a shepherd. So it's a shepherd kind of story. And here's a man who had, you know, a lot of sheep, kind of like David, a whole lot. He had tons. And, and he had this one guy uh, that just had this little lamb and they had it as a house pet. Well, this man with a whole lot has somebody, you know, come over and visit with him and he needs to prepare some food for him. So what he decides to do is instead of taking one from his very numerous flock, he takes this guy's pet lamb, slaughters it. Well, David gets hopping mad. <laughs> he can't believe this. And, 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 and he says, that guy needs to be he needs to pay it back four times over, et cetera, et cetera. And what Nathan says right before this famous line, you are the man that gets David's attention. He says, as it says in the scripture, 
He showed no compassion. See, this man in the story showed no compassion. David showed no compassion. He says it like it is. And then Nathan says, you are that man. It breaks David's heart. He realizes his sin in that moment. Why did it take him so long? Why does it take us so long? Are we not listening to God's spirit speak? Well, how do we do that more so? How do we pay better attention? Well, it, it takes a willingness to, an openness to. So where do we go from here? What is the application point? Well, I crafted a prayer a long time ago. I call it the prayer of commitment. But the first, first part of it simply says, God, I realize that I have sinned. That's where it begins. I believe that's first base. God, I realize that I have sinned and that my sin separates me from you. That's what happened with David. Why did it take so long? Well, a lot of other things were in the way of his picture where God was not able to communicate effectively enough for David to hear. Now, is that God's fault? No, it's David's fault. And it took someone to pierce that darkness, to reveal the truth so that he heard it. I realized that I have sinned. First base. I realize that I have sinned, so on, that my sin separates me from you. It causes an estrangement, a broken relationship. David realizes that. And he cries out in Psalm 51 for God's grace, for God's mercy. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit in me. That sounds like somebody who realized their sin. So that's where it begins. God, I realize that I have sinned, that my sin separates me from you. I come to you in repentance. And true repentance is a change of heart first. A change of mind. Oh, I did wrong. David, you're the man, Nathan says. Oh, I did wrong. It changes the heart. Oh, I feel terrible. And he turns around and he returns to God. That's the second R, repentance. I would say that's second base, not first base. Realize the sin. Repent of the sin. And then third base is to receive that forgiveness that God wants to give graciously. He's there with his arms out. I've got this for you. It's kind of like that, uh, that coach on the third baseline saying, come on, come on, you can do it as you're round in second base. Come on and receive slides right in, but it's not done there. When we receive his forgiveness in Christ, he takes us home, he takes us home to be with him. That's why God has called us to be in Christ, Christ in us, in us in him. First base is to realize our sin. We need to be paying attention. And that comes when we're in an ongoing conversation with God. David was not, obviously. God used Nathan, even 9, 10, 12 months later. But he got his attention. You see how persistent God is, how loving God is? He wants us. He calls us to himself, to that place where we realize our sin, repent of it, receive his forgiveness, and are embraced then at home plate into the arms of the one who loves us so deeply. So in the course of this week coming, let us be in a constant conversation with God, open to his voice, directly by his spirit into our heart, through his scriptures and through other people. And through times like this, let us remember. Let us remember as we do every Sunday right now, as we celebrate together communion, as we commune, with God and one another, remembering the price that God prayed in Christ for our sins on the cross. That's where we're going in the season of Easter, to the cross and beyond, but first to the cross. And why the cross? Because that's where he paid the price, the love poured out that we might have life. And so he calls us to join together. So if you are in Christ, and if Christ is in you, 
and you are in right relationship with people. And if not, well, we need to get it right. And then we come and fellowship and then we join together. But if you are ready to partake now, let us do so. Remembering our Lord in the night in which he was betrayed, betrayed. Huh. Surely David betrayed God when he sinned. Surely we betray God when we sin. We say he is Lord, but we are not acting as though. So in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, we come to him with a repentant heart, realizing our sin, repenting of it, and ready to receive. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Take this and eat. And as often as you do this, remember me. Let us remember the one who never forgets us and loves us perfectly. In like manner, Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, this is my blood. It is of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take this, all of you, and drink it. And as often as you do this, remember me. Let us remember him and his love poured out for us in the cup. Lord Jesus, in this season of Lent, we hear your call. It was the call of the prophets, all the prophets up through John, calling the people, the nation, individuals to repent. And those were your words as well. But before we can get there, we must first realize our sin. Help us to, by being in constant communion with you, our hearts and minds open to you not compartmentalizing you throughout the course of a day, but always with you. You called your disciples to be with you. Help us to be with you, present with you. We call upon you and appeal to you to, by your spirit, draw us near to you and one another. And we thank you for doing so. Father, through your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So now, let us uh, share together uh, a little bit about what has just happened. I uh, would like to know, first of all, uh, if you have any questions about what you just heard, what you just experienced, any questions about what I just talked about? I would like to make one comment. So about fasting, um, I know there are people who can't fast all those meals because of medication or health, but there's other ways to fast, either giving up a meal, just one meal. If you're a coffee drinker, don't drink any coffee during the day. Um, I, I just would think to look for a way to focus on God when you're desiring something is what the whole point of it is. So if it's, um, I'm not going to go watch TV all day today, whatever it is that you normally do, I think taking that out is the point of the whole thing. Well, and the point with it is not simply taking something out, but replacing it. Yeah. As Dawn said, something that we would ordinarily do that is important to us, and we would replace it with time with God. And I think the more we practice time with God, the, the more we will get used to regularly being with God. Well, well let, let's just get right into, unless you have some questions, and, and you could throw out anything during this, this time together, but uh, a takeaway for you from our service today, and I say our service because I don't want to limit it just to the message you heard, but the service at large, what is a takeaway? In what way have you benefited? I loved when you said, um, always be in constant conversation with God. Mm -hmm. A conversation is two ways. Uh, you have to listen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thanks, Johnny. That is my takeaway too. And I'm learning that day by day. One of the things I've realized about myself is I was kind of a news junkie. And so during Lent, I have given up watching news and listening to news during the day. I, I don't want to be ignorant of what's going on. So I have this informant here, um, but in its place, I put on worship music. Wow, I am so much better in my mental health and my relationship with God, just doing that little tiny thing. Bart, can you send us the prayer of commitment? Of course I can. Be happy to do that. I would like I uh, I, I call them the three R's. You know how we have education is built on a foundation of three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. I don't know if that's the case anymore. <laughs> I hope so. But it's the basics. And you add to that, but you have to have the basics. And in the same way, the basics to a right relationship with people is the three R's, whether it's with God or other people. Um, it's things that we say and do that break relationships. And until the person that has offended the other by what they have said or done, until they realize what they've done and said or said is wrong, the relationship is broken. And when they realize it, what do we do? Well, we kind of turn from it and come to the other person and use words from the heart that are true and say, hey, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Of course, it puts the ball in the other person's court. What, what do they want to do with it? Have you ever said, I'm sorry to somebody and they just kind of kick dirt in your face and they don't, that's too bad. Or they say, yeah, you really are sorry. You know, and sometimes that happens and the relationship remains broken, but you've done all that you can. Not that way with God. He receives that sorrow and he gifts us that grace of his forgiveness pretty awesome it's really awesome somebody else another takeaway heather well i really appreciate being able to have communion on the road this morning because you know it really doesn't matter where we are jesus is with us so it's really us make, it's us being aware of his presence and in no matter where we are so i really appreciate that this morning. Yeah, because he is omnipresent he's here regardless of whether or not we recognize him or not helen and i were actually talking about this this exact thing uh, just yesterday i think it was that us inviting him in somewhere all it really is is us recognizing that he's already there so he's everywhere he's always here with us whether we're eating using the restroom, going to church, fellowshipping with him, whatever. He's always there with us. That is exactly right. And I know that it's not original with Craig because I've heard it from other people, but Craig is the first one who said to me, wherever you go, there you are. A long time ago, but wherever you go, there he is. <laughs> and that can be kind of frightening, can it? Because when you're not where you're supposed to be, there he is. When you're saying or doing what you shouldn't be saying or doing, there he is. And where he's there, the look that he gives us, and, and this is the most powerful little um, no words said scenario that I have from the Bible. Okay. Jesus is being questioned, and Peter is as close as he can get. He's by this fire warming himself. He's already been called out by several people. You know, hey, you were with him. And he says, no, I wasn't. But he's still there checking things out. And he's by this time when he denies that he knows Jesus or is associated with him at all. He says it for the third time. And it says the rooster crows. And it says Jesus turns and looks at him. From wherever Jesus is, he turns and looks at him. And in my imagination, 
that look is not you idiot you really you know my my friend you did this this anger this hatred i think it's just a look of of disappointment of disappointment that broke peter's heart he realized his sin then and it says that he went out from there and he wept bitterly and in the translation what that means he just uncontrolled he couldn't he couldn't get a hold of himself and i think wherever you go there he is and he's looking at us and when we're not doing what we ought to be doing his look is one of disappointment and if we're not paying attention we're just driving on so johnny that's the ongoing conversation eyes open seeing him yeah as frightening as it is, is as comforting as it is, you know? So yeah. you can be convicted, which is a good thing, but you can also rest and be loved and know that you're not in this alone. That's, that's beautiful. That's exactly right. And that what carries people were in, the, the, in a conflict, like in Ukraine. That's what's carrying them is knowing that God is right there with them. Another takeaway. Hey, uh, Don, thanks for joining us from uh, Germany over there. And I, I spoke of Anna briefly, but uh, what, what, what's your takeaway today, Donald? Uh, uh, hi, folks. Um, I guess a few things, but I'll just keep it short. Um, one is just my takeaway is the availability of everybody that's on this call right now and the prayers and just being able to fellowship, you know, you know with the means that we have. Um, and, you know, the simplicity of how we can pray, you know, you just mentioned Peter and I was meant, I was thinking while you were, you know, speaking, they're probably, and I mean, I don't know, but you're the you know subject matter expert and all this. The shortest prayer in the Bible was from Peter, where he stepped out of the boat under the water and started sinking. And he said, Lord, save me, you know, three words. You couldn't take one of those words out and still get the same result, right? I mean, that was a desperate prayer. And when I'm praying and trying to pray, I am just not gifted, you know, with words or anything like that. And so it's just really nice to know that sometimes I don't even have to say anything vocally. And God is right there and he, he knows it. Um, so again, before I get my ball off and weeds here, my takeaway is just that everybody's here that, you know, I'm able to join online with the technology we have in fellowship and be in prayer and to also know that there and i and i knew it anyhow but also again just to see it that you know there are folks around the world that are lifting up people in ukraine but also in russia too i mean my heart goes out to the russians i just i can't imagine how those people are feeling and, and i won't get into all that right now um but i just appreciate being here today that's my takeaway so thanks Thank you, Don. Love you, Don. Uh, perhaps uh, the deepest prayer of all is the one that we can't find the words. And, you know, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, where, where you can't find the words. And in the scripture, it says, and the spirit helps us with words that we can't articulate. That's, that's, that's very profound. Um, you know, this matter of God's presence, and I'll, I'll end it with this. Um, the question isn't whether God is present or not. I mean, just as Aaron said, he is omnipresent, which means all present. He is everywhere at the same time. Can't comprehend that, but he is like the air all around us. It's not a matter of whether God is present. It's whether we are present with him. And so God is present with us because he chooses to. We will be present with him if we choose to. So let's make that choice this week. 
and uh, join me again and Dawn in a time of fasting and prayer on Wednesday, but to be walking with him day by day and listening to his voice directly from his spirit as he speaks to us through his word and through one another. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give our world peace in Christ. Amen. We love you all. God bless you. Have a great day.